Welcome to my CompTIA Security Plus Guide to Network uh, Security Fundamentals Lecture Review. We're looking at the fifth edition of this book. We're looking at chapter seven, which is called Network Security Fundamentals. And lo and behold, it deals with the fundamentals of the devices dealing with network security. So we're gonna look at the different types of devices. We're gonna explain how the technologies improve security and we're going to describe security uh, design elements. First of all, understand that when we're talking network security, it's a layered approach. In-depth security is not a single layer, but it's multiple layers. So a defense that uses multiple types of security devices and controls to protect a network, also called defense in-depth. A network with layered, uh, layered security, basically it makes it harder it's like when you try to put uh, your car safe when you park in a parking lot, you make it as hard for someone to steal because, well, if the car next to yours has the windows open and yours has the windows up, that car is easier to steal, so the attacker will probably, the thief will probably steal that car instead of yours. The goal is to make your device or your network or your car more, honestly, more secure in terms of harder for the attacker or harder harder for the thief because normally the thief wants something easy the attackers want something easy so if you are a little bit harder than the person next to you then they're probably going to be the one attacked not you i always use the example of if you're in the woods and you see a bear how fast do you have to run you don't have to be super fast you have to be faster than the person next to you because the bear will get the person next to you if they're going slower than you are and while the bear is chomping on him you get time to run away and it's a crappy analogy but when we talk about security it's spot on basically in, under, uh, in order to implement layered security you have to understand the different tools and the knowledge uh, skill set are required to do so if you're the attacker you have to have more knowledge, more tools, and a larger skill set to break through each layer because each layer makes it that much harder or should make it that much harder or that much more time intensive. A layered network security uh, can be achieved by lots of different types of devices depending on your environment. Security features found in the network hardware today basically provide a basic level of security. The network devices can be classified in their OSI model, layer, layer 1, 2, 3, or physical data link network, transport, presentation, session, application, and so forth. OSI model breaks it into seven layers, which this is not a networking class, so I'm assuming you already know this. Uh, basically, we break it down in the different layers, layers 1, 2, 3, those are the big ones because layer 1 is more physical, it's the wiring. Layer 2 is going to deal with more switches. Layer 3 and 4 are going to be more with routers and firewalls and could also include some proxies in there. Here are the seven layers, their layer names, the description, and the overall functionality. Again, I'm assuming you've I've gone through some basic networking courses, so you already know these layers. If not, check out other videos on basic networking. I actually did a 14 video segment on Network Plus, if you want to review that to kind of make sure that you understand networking skills. Let's look at the first layer, sorry, let's look at the first major device. I think wiring needs to be the first one, but our author was very pro Starting with layer two, switching. A switch is a device that connects multiple uh, devices in the same network together. So switches work with LANs, operates at layer two, data link, deals with frames because the PDU at layer two is a frame. Frames deal with MAC addresses, and these can be determined which devices are connected to each port. Can forward frames sent to specific devices, unicast, or frames to all devices, broadcast. Again, it uses MAC addresses. 
An attacker attached to a switch will see only the frames that are directed to that device. You can set... Oh, I'm going to hang off on that comment. As opposed to a hub. With a hub, everything is one big broadcast domain and one large collision domain. So frames forwarded out one port on a hub would go be sent to all other ports. With a switch, that's not the same anymore. A switch, each port is its own collision domain. Because a switch does not repeat frames that are not destined for those individual ports. So if you want, as an attacker, to collect data on the switches, you have to use what's called a protocol analyzer to capture packets or capture frames, like Wireshark. You don't normally see a lot of hu or hubs anymore. Most things have been moved to switches. The nice thing with switches is you can have a lot of layer 2 security, such as port security. And that's normally discussed very heavily in the CCNA or CCNA security, but you can actually filter off of MAC addresses. So when you plug into a port, if that port does not recognize the MAC address, the port can actually have a certain level of control that can be performed based off that MAC address. It can turn off, it can turn on, it can disable itself until a good MAC address is found, and so forth. So since we're talking about the packet analyzers or the frame analyzers, one of the things to bring up is that a network administrator should have the ability to monitor the network traffic. So there are a legitimate reason for those uh, tools. So part of that it helps identify and troubleshoot problems and it also helps verify enforcement of certain policies. So traffic monitoring methods can have a few different types of mechanisms. Uh, you can use a protocol, protocol analyzer. You can use like port mirroring or a network cap. All right, so uh, a port mirroring basically allows us to configure a switch port on a switch that basically will send a copy. Every frame that the switch gets will go to its regular destination and, and it will also go to that mirrored port. A network tap, that tap is called a test access point. Separate devices installed between two network devices so that it can also capture traffic. Alright, so a standard network design. We may have a uh, regular network coming in from the bottom. It'll go to a core level switch. That switch may have a mirrored port on it that will go to a network analyzing station and then also have a connection to a layer 3 device. I don't like this photo because it says going up will be the internet. In reality that would be a layer 3 device. Typically a router. Where a network tap basically allows us to put it in the flow of traffic. That way everything has to flow through that tap for that tap to capture it. Standard network devices, some of the different types of attacks, like a MAC flooding or a, a, a MAC impersonation or a spoofed MAC. ARP poisoning. ARP poisoning is actually a very common one. Uh, ARP is an address resolution protocol. You can actually poison the network. You can poison all the ARP requests. Uh, MAC flooding is when an attacker can overflow the switch's address table, called the CAM table with fake MAC addresses, forcing it to act like a hub. Basically, you tear down its resources so it has no spare resources to actually operate. And then the more heavy of a load the switch gets, the dumber and dumber then it becomes. All right, moving on, let's talk about layer three devices, like a router. A router routes. It makes, makes uh, decisions, network-based decisions, Forwarding packets across different networks, different LANs, operates at layer 3, and you can filter off of source and destination IP addresses. We also have what's called a load balancer. Load balancers allow us to load balance between two paths out. 
basically helping us to distribute a load between both devices or between two internet connections or two uh, links and so forth. We have a few advanced load balancing technologies. Basically it reduces the probability of overloading a single server. Basically if you go to target something and if it's actually sitting behind a load balancer you may be targeting one of multiple connections so you may be able to take out one connection to a server but if it's being load balanced there could be a backup connection. Basically this allows us to reduce network downtime. Load balancers typically are operate layer 4 but we also have what's called a layer 7 load balancer which is basically focusing on the application layer. Security advance, the security advantages of our load balancers makes it really hard to do a DDoS attack or DDoS attack. Some can deny attacker information about the network. You can hide error pages, you can hide specific services, so there are some advantages. Proxies are another type of device. A proxy Basically, a proxy is a way for us to connect to a service outside of our network, typically, not always, but typically. And then we, from there, that device requests sites. So, for example, uh, at work, we have certain sites disabled, so I can't get to them. However, I can get to a proxy site, so my connection is with the proxy site. The proxy site then can go to that website that's my company does not allow. So in reality, I am not accessing that site. The proxy site is. And then this proxy site is just kind of funneling it back to me. So I've never actually go to the site. I'm using the proxy to go to the site. So it's a way to get around certain network-based policies or page policies. We also have what's called an application aware proxy. And these are special proxy servers that knows the application protocols and understands how to support them. Advantages of a proxy server uh, increases speeds, reduces costs. I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, they allow us to kind of skirt around policies. You can actually employ a proxy server so that it can filter out traffic. So basically you can have all of your staff go through a single proxy or a clustered proxy server. So not just a single proxy server, but you can go th uh, have them go through a group of proxy servers. That way, through those proxy servers, you can actually control what sites they're allowed to visit, how long they're allowed to visit, things like that. So you, you can have stronger security if you're employing your own proxy servers. Reverse proxies. This does not serve a client. Basically, it routes incoming requests to the correct servers. Again, we can have a proxy server on our network that allows us to kind of funnel traffic how we need to. Typically put in our DMZ. Specifically designed security hardware devices provide better protection. So now we're going to get more into the security devices like a dedicated network firewall. This can also be software based, though hardware based is still very common. We can have hardware and software based. You can have a host firewall that's a software based, which is going to be different from a network based firewall. We also have what's called uh, virtualized networking devices like VMRs and NSX. You can virtualize a software based firewall so even though it's on the network, it's not on a host, so we, we got room there. The purpose of a firewall is to inspect packets and either accept or deny. The hardware firewall are usually located outside the network security perimeter. I don't agree with that. Hardware firewalls typically are, are located within the perimeter, and if it's a proper design, throughout the network because again we want layered network or layered defenses so network security is not just at the perimeter 
methods that firewalls use for filtering, the two major types, stateless and stateful. Stateless basically will inspect incoming packets and permit or deny based on conditions set by the network administrator. Stateful packets basically keeps a record of the state of the connection and will make the decision based off the connection condition. Connection and conditions. Basically, you may deny all HTTP traffic coming in, but if it is initiating from the inside going out and it's stateful, normally HTTP requests coming in would be declined. However, since the request originated from inside the network, this, may, this might be permitted. Firewall actions on a packet typically are three major things. Allow, drop, or reject. Allow basically that lets the packet in. Drop prevents the packet from passing into the network and basically sends no response to the sender. Reject, pretty much the same as drop, however, but it will send a message to the sender. We can have what's called an access control list and that creates rules on our firewall that basically allows us to allow or deny based off those rules. It's a set of individual instructions that will control the action, typically called the firewall rule. I don't agree with that either. Yes, they're rules, but they're typically called an access control entry, ACE, or an access control list. An access control list is made up of several individual entries that creates those rules. Each rule is a separate instruction processed in sequence. That's an access control entry. Basically, your list will actually, it will be a list. Uh, part one, part two, part three, part four, and it will go line by line till it actually gets one of them. And the second it gets one of them or matches one of them, it no longer processes the rest of the list. That's why you want the most general access control entries on top and you want the more specific down low because again it's going to match them again these are more when you look at firewalls if it's hardware or software it's the same general premise whether it's network based or application based it's the same general premise we have an application aware firewall this is what's called the Next Generation Firewall, or NGFW. They operate at a higher level by identifying applications. So they're not just looking at the packets or the segments or port numbers. They're actually looking at the application data as well. And these are becoming more popular as ransomware has been increasing or other malicious software is coming through. We also have what's called a web application firewall, and these are special types of application-aware firewalls that look deeper into packets that carry HTTP or HTTPS traffic. Basically, you can block specific sites or specific types of HTTP traffic. Better securing of your network or better uh, controls or enforcement of controls in your network if you are blocking certain sites. Spam filter, because spam is basically now classified as uh, malware. Uh, basically, you can have enterprise-based uh, spam filter at the very entrance, so all emails flow through this. You can also do some pretty amazing things with our current spam filters. For example, I'm working with a casino group here in Las Vegas that basically, when you send HR a resume, they tell you it has to be in Word or PowerPoint or, or whatever they whatever format they want and so what it does is whatever you email in the filter captures your email puts it on hold will take any attachments that you send uh, in it will convert it so let's say the casino wants everything to be a PDF you email them a word document the software will take your email place it on hold look at the attachment, see it's a Word document, convert it to a PDF, and then allow the forwarding on. That way, if there is any malicious code in it, then well, it was converted all to a PDF. So any additional code could then go inert. If it's already a PDF, 
this will again take the PDF and will reconvert it back to another PDF but again it's looking for any of the additional code making that code unexecutable. Email systems typically use the two protocols that straight out lie. Uh, normally a email server will function two different ways a mail transfer agent MTA and a mail delivery agent. Basically our goal here is to realize we have to have a way to send and receive mail. If we're sending mail, it's going to be SMTP. Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, SMTP. If we are going to handle incoming mail, we have two major protocols, POP or IMAP. Those are the two big common uh, for incoming mail messages. Again, SMTP is the common outgoing, POP and IMAP are the common incoming. POP typically handles uh, on port 25, that's the unsecure port, and this will pass non-spam emails to any service that's, or any uh, server listening on port 25, because typically that's, they're listening to receive mail. So if you set up Exchange, for example, it should be listening on port 25, because that's the SMTP port. However, if we're doing secure SMTP, that's a totally different port, and we're going to get that into a later chapter. Here again, we have an SMTP server, we may have a spam filter, and as we leave our spam filter, we may actually change the port number for our internal SMTP server, and at that point, we're now looking at how the different ports will actually then separate. Because again, SMTP for sending is port 25. For mail delivery or incoming mail, we're looking at POP or IMAP. Here, they're doing POP because POP uses port 110. The nice thing is spam filters can be installed on the outgoing and incoming servers. Not just POP3, but IMAP as well. All spam must filter uh, through an SMTP server and be delivered to the user's mailbox. This does increase user or the costs of those items. Uh, basically, items for storage, transmissions, backups, and deletions, compliance requirements, or electronic holds are all critical here. But when we're talking spam filters, they can... Uh, incur a lot more costs than originally intended. Third-party uh, entity contract to spam filter, for example, basically you can contract with uh, spam filter organizations so your MX records are pointed to them. Basically, all mail will flow through those spam filters that are third-party. That way your organization does not have to incur that cost. So here we have, again, sending. Here we're at the example would be the SAM filter would be on the POP3 server. Basically, as the email is received, it will be sent through the POP3 server. And before it's actually received by the end user, we'll go through a SPAM filter as well. All right, moving on. We have what's called our VPNs, or Virtual Private Network. And this will allow us to enable authorized users to use an unsecured public network as if they are in a secure private network. Basically, all data between the user and the corporate network resource would be secured. There are two major types. These are not the only types, but these are the major ones. Remote access and site-to-site. -site. Remote access is basically when you have like a mobile user, Starbucks, McDonald's, at home, wherever their public IP address can change. So, that forces it to be a little bit more structured. In terms of, this user is allowed access from any IP address to this enterprise resource. A little bit more controls are there. Verifying the user, authenticating the user, as opposed to a site-to-site, -site, where a site-to-site -site will have a public IP on both sides, typically a static address, and thus, you don't have to worry about 
different addresses on either side because they're a static address. Once they're set, as long as the ISP doesn't update them, that type of site will use the same static IPs on both sides, so you don't have to worry about the multiple addresses. So which is more secure? It, they're different purposes. So you can't say one is more secure than the other because the purposes of these tools are different. Here we're talking endpoint. The end of a tunnel uh, using communication. Basically this could be if you're a mobile user, you're tunneling into the corporate environment. The corporate environment would be the endpoint from their perspective of the user. However, from the corporate side, the endpoints could be the remote users. So it kind of is subjective. Normally we're talking on the resource or the device trying to connect to the corporate network. They're trying to connect typically to a VPN concentrator, which is a dedicated hardware device that aggregates hundreds or more VPN connections for these mobile VPN users. Though these are falling out of favor because they're not as... Honestly, the next generation firewalls can handle the hundreds and thousands of connections better than a VPN concentrator just because the technology has changed. There are tunneling protocols associated with VPNs. IPsec is one of the big ones. IPsec has two sub-protocols, which is the encapsulated security payload, ESP. That's where the payload is encapsulated. Then we have authentication header. That basically uh, gives you a hash message authorization control, or an HMAC. Basically, you can verify the identity of the source and destination, though the AH does not provide security or encryption. So, okay, it does provide security, but not in the form of encryption. ESP is what does the encrypting part. A remote access VPN normally uses either IPsec or L2TP. Sadly, there are still a lot of organizations out there using PPTP or point-to-point -point protocol or PPTP, point-to-point -point protocol, point-to-point -point transfer protocol. And those are outdated technologies. IPsec is the one that's most preferred. If IPsec is not available, Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol or L2TP is the protocol to use. Content filtering. We can monitor internet traffic. We can actually filter internet traffic if the organization allows. Basically, we can whitelist or blacklist websites. For example, I work for a college. They blacklist any site that allows you to purchase weapons. They blacklist any adult content sites. Though, the wording adult gets very subjective because adult content is not always pornography. We actually had to find out the hard way because when we blocked adult content, that also blocked a lot of news stations because the content they were dealing with was mature in nature, adult content, not pornography. So you can do content based off of key words pornography, sex, violence, but again you have to be specific because you may accidentally block a site that you did not want to block to begin with. We have URL filtering, we also have malware inspection and filtering. You can actually prohibit file downloads if your organization allows for that and you can do what's called reporting. Uh, reporting uh, basically allows the administrator or who's ever managing the adult, sorry, who's ever managing the content filtering, basically they can get reports on how successful, how many blocks, things of that nature. We also have what's called a web security gateway, and this can block malicious content in real time. That does mean that traffic has to flow through this though, so this may slow down the, a network. Examples uh, it could, of web blocking, adware, spyware, cookies, instant messaging, peer-to-peer, -peer, 
Uh, you can actually prevent a lot of script exploits if we are running a web security gateway or any type of malicious code attacking TCP IP. But again, that does mean that there has to be a, a device placed between the internet and the router or the internet and our connections because everything will have to flow through that device because that's how it works. On the network, we can also have other types of monitoring devices, IDSs or Intrusion Detection System or an Intrusion Prevention System, IPS. These are two different types of technologies. IDSs can detect attacks as it, it occurs. It uses different methodologies for monitoring for attacks and it can be installed on the network or on hosts and it can do something in terms of maybe alert you where IDSs, they have an extension called an IPS, which is more active. Not only can it do something like email you, but it may be able to adapt rules. Where IDSs is more of passive, it can't really adapt rules because that's not its purpose. The IPS is what actually does that. And what I mean by that is maybe the system detects a lot of incoming packets from a IP address from China, for example. Well, an IDS will just be able to email you, hey, I see an increase in traffic coming from this address, we may want to review. Where an IPS may see it and then may automatically put a block in place for that IP address for an hour or whatever set time that you decide to set. Basically, if too much traffic comes in from that Chinese IP address, it can then say, hey, this might be an attack. Let's put a cooldown timer on and then basically prevents traffic coming from that address to be received. Again, it's more active. Monitoring methods, this is important, comes in four major flavors. Anomaly, ba or anomaly based signature behavior or heuristics. Heuristics is based off of user experience. Behavior will look at what's abnormal and what's normal and will basically determine anything that's abnormal and what control is based off of that. Signatures will look for well-known attack signatures or well-known patterns. That does mean for new attacks, signature based is not the best. Anomaly compares current detected behavior with a baseline and if it's different from the baseline, it may then prevent it. Trap application port scans. The, here are four major metho uh, methodologies. And some of them can actually prevent those scans from happening. We talked about IDSs and IPSs. And again, we, they can run on the network. That would be a network IDS or NID. Or we can have a host based, which would be called a HID, H-I-D-S. Basically, IDS, ho uh, H in the front is a host based, IDS with an N in the front, that would be a network based. The host based is typically a software based application installed on the system needing the protection, and it's used for monitoring. Monitoring the system, it can uh, recognize an authorized modification of the system, and it, again, can do some type of alerting. Disadvantages, they cannot monitor network traffic. They only monitor what's happening on that host. All log data is stored locally, and they can be very resource intensive. Again, we have a network IDS, in IDS, watches for uh, network attacks, and it watches the network it can actually have sensors installed on the network, both on firewalls and routers, that help further gather information. Passive NIDs will sound an alarm, like sending an email to an administrator, because they're passive. Any NID may use one or more of the evaluation techniques listed in the Table 7.5 in our book. Also on the, on the next page, here's Table 7.5. We can verify protocols, we can verify applications, and we can also create additional logs based off of them. 
Again, protocols will use very common protocols and the appropriate port numbers. Application protocol verification will basically allow us to look at invalid protocol behavior and to look at telltale signatures of common types of attacks to kind of help prevent them. For example, a DNS poisoning or ART poisoning, that has a very well-defined signature. And so if the IDS sees that, it can help prevent that because those are known signatures. Application aware IDSs, these are more specialized. They're capable of using contextual knowledge in real time. It understands what operating system you have and it understands the basic operations of that operating system so it can be more adaptive. Moving on, IPSs. This is very similar to IDS. However, IPS is more on the prevention. It's more on the active side. It helps monitor network traffic and it can block if necessary. Not just email you, but it can make its own decisions. So it can block traffic. It has both network and host based IPSs. A network IPS has to be in line. Basically, you have to funnel traffic through it. We can also have an application aware IPS. And again, it looks at applications, it understands current operating systems, and it understands how they should operate, and it can make decisions based off of that baseline. We also have what's called a Unified Threat Management or UTM appliance. These are becoming more and more popular. These appliances have multiple security functionality, anti-spam, anti-phishing, uh, anti-virus, spyware, anti-malware, content filtering. It could also be a firewall. It could also be a web content filtering. It can be an IDS and an IPS all in one. Though these are pretty expensive items, they are becoming more and more popular. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about internet routers normally uh, drop packets with a uh, private IP. That's because private IPs cannot be uh, on the internet or a uh, public network. That's because private IPs are typically masked for uh, well, private networks, and the internet's a public network, so there has to be a mechanism put in place that will allow us to mask our private IPs to a public IP, and this is done in one of two ways. Uh, typically, a variation of NAT, Network Address Translation, and NAT has several different flavors. Traditional NAT allows a private IP address to be used on a public network, basically replaces or masks the private IP address with a public address. This be, uh, can be done by one-to-one -one mapping, so one private to one public, or we can do what's called PATS, and that is a variation of several private to one public, and then they differentiate them by using different outgoing port numbers. Basically, uh, that allows the router or firewall, well typically it's a router, to understand that the originating IP address will have a IP and port number and the destination public IP address. So as it leaves the router's outbound interface, it will then remove the public IP or sorry, it will remove the uh, private IP and will replace it with a public IP, but it will record the mapping and the port number. That way, as it returns, it should be returning on that same port number. The router will look at that and go, oh, that port number is associated with this private IP. Let's forward this to that internal host. Again, I actually have done several videos on NAT and PAT, so check out my playlists for in-depth understanding of NAT and PAT. So, um, again, understanding it, here we have the original, and then we have our masked address. Advantages of NAT is allows us to mask our internal IP addresses, and we don't need as many public IP addresses. 
Moving past that, we have what's called NAC or NAP, N-A-P, N-A-C. NAC is typically done on the hardware and it examines the current state of a system or device before allowing them to make a network connection. The device must meet a certain list of criteria. If not, NAC can quarantine that device until it has those areas fixed. For example, it can look at the operating system and force all devices to have a current updated OS. Or it can say, hey, do you have a current updated antivirus or anti-malware? And if yes, you're allowed on the network. If no, you're quarantined until that is remedied. Here is the flow chart of it. You're going to notice this will be more of a um, health certificate. Basically, it will flow through the network and allow us to see if you are attached, if you do meet the criteria. If not, then you'll be thrown into a quarantine network and so forth. And But it also gives you a way to remedy the state. Remedy the state in terms of if you don't have an update, it may put your quarantine network, but then it gives you access to a patch management server so that you can actually patch yourself. If you don't have a current antivirus, again, it will put you in line with the antivirus server so that you can get the appropriate updates so that you can move from the quarantine network, meet the criteria list, and move placed back in the main network. And this can be done through either the hardware or through software. Because Cisco has a NAC and Microsoft has a NAP. And it's the same general premise, it's just done through different states. I may flip that, I think Cisco has NAP and Microsoft has NAC. It's been a little while since I've had to go through my NAC and MAP, so. Anyways, moving on. Last major area is understanding the elements of a secure network design. And apparently we don't want to... There we go. Understanding the DMZ. Understanding how to segment our networks in terms of subnetting and our VLANs. VLANs, both in public and private VLAN technology. Lastly, understanding remote access. DMZ separates the network located uh, from outside resources and inside resources. Also understanding the network perimeter. Untrusted outside users can access the DMZ, but they shouldn't be able to access the more internal secured resources. Here we may have our DMZ to the right. Those are going to be accessible to network resources and to the internet. So keep that in mind when we have a firewall put in between our DMZ and our internal network. You'll also notice that we may have an additional firewall protecting our internal network, not just the one main firewall. Especially if we're talking, if we want our internal to be able to access the DMZ, we may want to have another firewall preventing or just protecting uh, unauthorized access from the internet to our internal network. Subnetting, we're not covering subnetting here. Uh, this is normally, subnetting is a way of setting different networks or sub-networks that require a layer three device, whether it be a layer three switch or a layer three, well, router. There's not really a layer, any other layer router because routers operate at layer three, but they allow us to separate networks uh, in different uh, sub-network groups. This improves the network security by being able to isolate hosts. Here we may have different sub-networks. Again, different layer three devices to allow communication between our sub-networks. But again, this will allow us to have, and they're all, I'll notice they're all public IP addresses. This really isn't realistic. Normally we would be doing several sub-networks 
using private IPs and then as it gets closer to the top or co uh, closer to the core layer network then we start talking more public IPs but you're not dealing with a bunch of private sorry you're not going to be dealing with a bunch of public IPs throughout your network because that gets pricey normally within the network we're dealing with private IPs subnetting allows for greater flexibility greater security better flow management so how does that differ from a VLAN in all honesty when I'm looking at both of these they go hand in hand you can isolate sensitive data to different VLANs a VLAN is going to be a different network again communication on a VLAN you can actually control what is accessible uh, even within a VLAN we're used to talking about public VLANs only so you can have like a server VLAN well the problem with that is what happens if you don't want the hosts on the server VLAN communicating with one another you can actually have what's called a private VLAN put in place that way you can group the resources all the servers in a server VLAN but you can make it so that the servers cannot communicate with one another they can only communicate outward lastly is a remote access again that's the ability to have workers remotely being able to tunnel back in for network resources and that's the end of this chapter we talked about basic standards hardware VPN IDS's IPS's forms of NAT and methods for designing a secured network. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.